Hey everybody, it's Matt Chu from Upright Health. Today is going to be a podcast episode about surgery and the placebo effect. We're going to be talking about some passages in this book called Hypocrisy. It is by Rachel Bookbinder and Ian Harris. Um, they are two physicians. One, Rachel, is a um, rheumatologist and Ian Harris is an orthopedic surgeon, and both of them appear to have training in clinical epidemiology. They both are strong, com strong components, strong components of the movement to fix the medical system. But the word I was looking for was proponents. They are strong proponents of fixing the medical system, and they have written this incredible book that I am halfway through that is talking about all kinds of medical treatments, the history of different medical treatments, and how many medical treatments turn out to be not just useless, but actually worse than useless, actively harmful to patients. And in this book, they detail so many different instances where surgeries, for example, that uh, surgeons were absolutely 100% confident were absolutely necessary, turned out to be not necessarily, not necessary and harmful to the patients. So today we're gonna to be looking at some examples. And um, I, as I've been reading this book, I have just been itching, itching to share some of this stuff so it just gets out there quickly. So that's why I'm here right now doing this. So we're gonna look at, on page 61 of this book, the vertebroplasty affair. So this is basically when uh, it generally happens to older adults with osteoporosis. Um, there, you basically fracture your spine, part of your spinal column, the bones in your spine fracture. And uh, there are an estimated 700,000 cases annually in the United States alone. In Australia, there were estimated to be more than 25,500 in 2012. And it's expected to rise to over 35,000 by 2022. So it's a lot, okay? There's a lot of people thousands of people who get these spinal fractures. This is coming from, remember, physicians, this is coming from, in particular, an orthopedic surgeon, right? They generally heal within a few weeks or months, but until that time, they may cause severe pain and disability. Vertebroplasty is a treatment that involves the injection of an acrylic cement into fractures in the spine. So basically, if you have a crack in your spine, they inject cement and fix that that crack, right? So um, it is a treatment that was introduced first in the late 1980s. It's performed by radiologists, surgeons, blah, de, blah, de, blah. So um, early observations published over the first 15 years indicated that it quickly and dramatically improved pain. On average, across 30 observational studies, and, and, and they really point out observational studies, the pain improved from a score of about eight out of 10, where zero is no pain and 10 very severe pain, to about two and a half, and serious complications were reported in less than 1% of patients. So this was hailed as a miracle cure in June of 2003. Okay, so there's a whole bunch more here. You should read all this. We're gonna fast forward. The first two randomized blinded trials of vertebroplasty weren't published until 2009, more than 20 years after vertebroplasty had been introduced into practice. Okay, and in fact, one of the authors, Rachel, I hope it's Rachel, not Rochelle, but I'm pretty sure it's Rachel, um, was the principal investigator on one of these trials. And unlike the previous trials, the comparison groups in both trials received a placebo procedure. That means they were treated exactly the same as those in the vertebroplasty group, except they didn't have the actual vertebroplasty. They received medication to make them sleepy, an injection of local anesthetic, and a needle inserted into their back, everything except for having the cement injected. All right, so this is super important to understand. So when you set up a trial to see how effective the medical treatment is, you wanna make sure that what you're, that what you're comparing to is convincing, right? Um, so if you look at recent trials on say hip surgery for hip impingement, you see that all the, the trials are set up with surgery versus crappy physical therapy or surgery versus um, no treatment and basically just counseling the, counseling the patients to just grin and bear it, right? Often the physical therapy protocols are just, um, you're not gonna fix your bad bone shapes without surgery, but just hang out for a little bit for like 
hang out for a few months and if it doesn't get better then we'll let you do the surgery right so like not fair comparisons in this case they're doing a trial where they say you're not going to know whether you got the real treatment or not because we're going, we're going to make sure it's as far as you can tell all the same okay so this is fantastic so this basically determines whether the the uh, reasoning that that, that the treating doctors give for why it supposedly works is real and whether the effect is real, okay? So um, the participants in these trials are all blinded, so any differences between the real, the, the real procedure and the placebo group can be attributed to the true effect of the actual vertebroplasty and not to other factors such as how they were expecting to feel. Okay, so both trials also blinded the investigators, reducing the chance that they would somehow treat the two groups differently. This is so important too because when you look at hip impingement trials, um, you, there's no blinding of any of that, right? The, the physical therapist, like you, you obviously know if you're a physical therapist dealing with somebody with hip impingement in this trial that they're receiving physical therapy, the patient knows it, everybody knows it, and everybody in the trial is telling the patients that they're not going to get better, that there's just like no way to get better unless you fix the bone shapes, right? Okay, so there's massive bias in that, okay? Anyway, back onto this, the results of the two trials, uh, excuse me, um, Let's see, the results of the two trials are almost identical. In both, those who received the placebo and those who got the, the vertebroplasty improved by about the same amount. This was chronicled in a 2010 editorial written by Dr. Eugene Karaji, an orthopedic surgeon and editor of the Spine Journal. He titled it, The Vertebroplasty Affair, The Mysterious Case of the Disappearing Effect Size. So basically, when they did these two trials, they discovered, hey, if we trick people into thinking they got the actual surgery done, they get better at the same rate, okay? So this is what goes on with placebo in surgery, right? The more you believe that this high-tech thing that a savior is performing on you, the more likely you're going to feel relief, okay? So let's see, three more placebo-controlled trials investigating uh, this vertebroplasty question have now been completed. The result of, results of two of these trials were exactly the same as the previous trials and showed no benefit from vertebroplasty. The third trial claimed there was some limited benefit, but whether these were clinically relevant is debatable. So basically, you have a bunch of placebo-controlled contr trials, and they all basically said, well, it's not better than fake placebo surgery. Okay? So that doesn't mean that the... the, the uh, vertebroplasty industry has just shuttered, right? Doesn't mean it all stopped. Um, because vertebroplasty is lucrative. I'm reading from the book written by doctors. Vertebroplasty is lucrative for the doctors who do it as well as the device companies that provide the vertebroplasty kits estimated to be worth $72 million in the North American market alone in 2016. It appears that they may go to any lengths to continue the practice. So, and then there's this whole paragraph here that talks about something I hadn't heard about, which is that um, these device manufacturers will actually pay, um, pay covert operatives to go on Wikipedia to change entries in Wikipedia to make certain procedures seem better. And in this case, there was a, uh, a company that was paying somebody to go onto Wikipedia uh, to add something to a statement. So one change was to add, after a statement that indicated that the procedures are, quote, controversial, the words, quote, among some, but not among the actual physicians who perform these procedures. So there's actual active propaganda campaigns going on, paid for by device manufacturers to edit Wikipedia to twist people's perceptions about what's going on, even though you have multiple randomized placebo-controlled trials that establish pretty well beyond doubt that the procedure is not good, okay? So that's just a really useful uh, story to hear, okay? And then I wanna just talk about two more quick ones, knee arthroscopy. So in this book, um, they talk about how basically knee arthroscopy for um, degenerate excuse me, degenerative changes like uh, 
meniscus tears, like knee osteoarthritis. Um, knee arthroscopy to go in and allegedly clean the joint and fix the stuff in there has been shown in multiple placebo-controlled trials to be no better than placebo, okay? Detailing that on page 69. So in some countries, some regions such as Norway and Australia, the number of knee arthroscopies have, has fallen significantly. But in many countries and regions, they have not, and in others, they continue to rise. So you need to hear that again, because in some countries, despite all the scientific evidence, knee arthroscopies are still happening, okay? And in the United States, knee arthroscopy is still, I, I believe it's still the number one um, uh, orthopedic surgery. It's a huge moneymaker. It's continuing despite the fact that it has already been demonstrated to be no better than placebo. There are plenty of surgeons who will still tell you that's what you need to do to fix your knee osteoarthritis, even though there's evidence, strong evidence, that surgery to fix knee osteoarthritis doesn't really work. Okay, so again, book written by two doctors. One of them is an orthopedic surgeon. So hypocrisy, please read the book. Um, and then on page 70, this is actually something that uh, I just finished writing an article about, and I'm happy to see it here, but it's about shoulder impingement. And shoulder impingement um, should be something you pay attention to if you're somebody with hip pain. Why? Because uh, if you have been told you have hip impingement, you should look at the history of the shoulder impingement diagnosis so you understand the context that you are swimming in. All right, so shoulder impingement, the basic idea for decades, uh, I wish I could remember the date, but there was a doctor uh, near who came up, I believe, I don't wanna mess this up, but there was a doctor who came up with this, I believe in the 50s, basically looked at a bunch of cadavers and thought, well, I think the reason people get rotator cuff tears is because the shape of their acromion process, this little the bony protuberance out here that's directly above, um, your humerus above your arm bone, there's a little bony thing here. That bony thing, he claimed, he believed that the shape of that was causing people to get rotator cuff tears. If you had a bad shape up there, then it was gonna cut into your, your rotator cuff tendons and result in problems. And so he created this whole industry called acromioplasty, which is basically when you go and you shave the bone to make it a better shape based on his theory. And that was supposed to fix and, and resolve painful you know, arm raises. So he invented all these tests that supposedly identified bad acromion shapes. And if you would lift your arm up or you did whatever, or you twist your arm, whatever, whatever, whatever. All of those tests have been shown to have no correlation to acromion shape. Acromion shape, meaning the bone shape, has no correlation to actual pain or movement problems, okay? And then finally, uh, there were placebo studies. Two studies have now shown that surgery is no better than placebo surgery. So again, bone shaving surgery to fix shoulder impingement has been demonstrated twice in placebo controlled trials um, to be not any more effective than a fake surgery, right? A fake placebo surgery is just as effective as the real thing, which means the surgery is bunk, okay? Hip impingement is literally the, ex the exact same story. The exact same story of, hey, your bones are shaped improperly. We're just gonna shave the bones and that's gonna fix your problems. But we are about 20 years out from when they first really started doing this and still no placebo controlled trials but all the randomized controlled trials that are coming out about it where they compare it to physical therapy show mild, if any, extra benefit. And the one randomized controlled trial that has the longest follow-up period of two years has shown that both physical therapy and, well, both crappy physical therapy and um, arthroscopy for your hip are equally bad. Like people, the patients who went through this basically said at two years, still not that great. Okay. so. When they do the placebo-controlled trials on hip impingement surgery, it'll be really interesting to see. One interesting thing to note is that in Australia, their Medicare system doesn't pay for hip impingement surgery because they have decided, well, they have correctly assessed that there's no scientific evidence that the procedure actually works or is indicated because it doesn't work. 
or if it does work, it might be because of the placebo effect, right? Okay, so now I'm saying all this. When I say stuff like this, people attack me, and there's a section um, in this book that's really interesting because it refers to exactly what's going on. So I'll tell people, my opinion is there's not enough evidence to do these surgeries. I'm not a doctor, but when I read the things that doctors are publishing to prove that their surgeries work, it makes me want to laugh and cry because the science is so bad and so clearly obviously in the other direction. So what happens is then people say I am dangerous. And um, I just want to point out, I, I just felt good um, reading some of the stuff in this book because uh, these doctors get attacked also for talking about this stuff. And um, they talk about um, Dr. Semmelweis, who way back when was the first proponent proponent of doctors washing their hands to prevent infection of their patients, okay? When Dr. Semmelweis um, proposed this and said like, hey guys, look, when we keep our hands clean before dealing with um, women, I think it's during pregnancy or after pregnancy, if we wash our hands, if we use an antiseptic before we treat our patients and deal with our patients, they don't die as much. Like it was a dramatic, I, I, I'm, I, I don't know where in the book it is. It's earlier than page 71, but if you read the book, you'll see it. Our patients don't die as much if we wash our hands. And the reaction from doctors was, you are full of poo, right? You are a terrible person. This is blasphemous for you to say that doctors need to wash their hands. We are gentlemen. You, sir, and here's where it gets good. They said, <clears throat> you sir are crazy. At the age of 47, he was committed to a lunatic asylum by his colleagues, allegedly suffering a nervous breakdown related to his insistence on believing and promoting his findings. He died two weeks later after being beaten by the guards. Okay, so uh, there's a great story in here that I invite you to go find about uh, washing your hands in medical practice. Dr. Semmelweis had just very clear evidence that antiseptic treatment of the hands, just making sure your hands were clean before you were dealing with patients, could prevent infection and death. And he had very strong evidence for it. And rather than embrace this change in practice, the doctors around him said, you are a lunatic. You need to give up this crazy idea that we got germs floating around. Uh, part of this story is that at the point he was proposing this idea, nobody had yet observed germs, right? So he was kind of ahead of his time. And so everyone was like, this, this, this doesn't make sense. It's absolutely impossible. You're crazy. Okay. This was, and it took, I forgot how many years it was. It, I think it took more than a hundred years for his ideas to even, even be accepted widely and put into practice washing hands, okay? Um, so it's important for you to recognize uh, that just because a doctor says that they are confident in something does not mean that they have necessarily critically assessed what's going on. And also, if they benefit greatly financially from continuing what they have always done, it is highly unlikely, or at least very difficult for them to change what they've been doing. If you're a shoulder surgeon who makes all your money on, on shoulder impingement surgery, your livelihood literally depends on not believing what the science says. Okay, so there's a great sentence here that I'm just gonna share and then we're gonna close. Page 70, it's often said that surgeons are often wrong, but never in doubt. Okay, <clears throat> so written by two physicians, one of them is an orthopedic surgeon who I, apl I applaud both of these doctors for just going out, going out on a limb, publishing books like this, detailing issues in the medical system and explaining exactly where the faults lie. Um, I am probably going to do a few more episodes on this book. Uh, I encourage you to get this book. 
I requested it from my library. Go get it online wherever you can. If your library can get you books, go ask them to get you this book. It's fantastic and will help you understand where the perverse incentives are, why they continue, and why procedures that are unnecessary, unfounded, and often deleterious are still common practice and what you should do to protect yourself. Um, so today we've talked about placebo. What, what is a placebo surgery? We've talked about the placebo effect and how that shows up with so many orthopedic surgeries. I hope it has helped you. Um, again, dive deeper uh, into this book and learn about all the many procedures that can mess you up. Um, if you go to uprighthealth.com help, I also have articles that talk about this. Um, I have an article about orthopedic surgery and the history of orthopedic surgery that kind of gives you an overview. Um, I encourage you to go check that out. It's at the top of the page, the fundamental knowledge section. Just go educate yourself, understand what's going on. Um, check out any of my other videos. I hope this was helpful. Like and share and review wherever you're watching or listening to this. I appreciate it, share it. If you want to support this channel, you can find me on Patreon. You can use the donate link that I'll have in the notes and in the description box on YouTube. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And I hope you always remember that pain sucks, life shouldn't. Mm -hmm.